It's a pleasure to have an opportunity to speak to everyone at the PacBio Global Summit on our work using PacBio SQL 2 technology in the analysis of three variant classes, nucleotide indel and structural variants uh, across diverse populations to support a long read sequencing project uh, for the All of Us Research Program. My name is Sean Levy. I'm a faculty investigator at the Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology and recently joined Discovery Life Sciences as their chief scientific officer for genomics. That change came about uh, a little over a year ago when Discovery Life Sciences uh, purchased the assets of the Hudson Alpha Genomic Services Laboratory that I was the founding director of beginning a little over 10 years ago. Now the Genomic Services Lab, similar to many genome centers uh, or large genomic laboratories around the country, had a, a huge increase in volume of project and sequencing output as technologies improved, mainly around short read sequencing from Illumina, to, to enable whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, and RNA analysis via transcriptomics at, uh, at genome scale, uh, both affordable, high performance, and extremely scalable. Um, to date, uh, those efforts have, been, have represented the vast majority, or, or nearly 100% of, of uh, whole genome sequencing, at least in terms of population analysis and medical, uh, medical sequencing. Although, over the last few years, the value of long read sequencing and the resolution that the increase in read length brings to a variety of study has started to become very appreciated uh, and, and, in, and in many cases transformative to de novo genome sequencing, um, the efficiency of, of those efforts, as well as um, improving the resolution of not only medically relevant genes that are challenging with short read sequencing, but also revealing regions of the genome that even to date has been, has been unattainable uh, with, uh, with shorter read sequencing or other sequencing technologies. Um, you know, certainly um, represented by you know, a number of the consortia efforts that are, that are out there now, the Human Genome Structural Variant Consortium, the telomere to telomere efforts that are being led by uh, you know, outstanding scientists from around the world. Uh, my presentation today uh, we'll focus on um, uh, some early um, validation data as well as early insights into um, the steps necessary to scale long read sequencing to be used for the evaluation of population frequency, primarily of structural variants, but also an evaluation of the accuracy of indels and single nucleotide variants in those same data sets as it relates to short read sequencing. So uh, beginning, uh, beginning with a sh uh, small comparison, uh, the summary of short read and, and long read um, genome sequencing. I think as everyone is probably very familiar, paired end sequencing, 150 nucleotide read lengths has really become the standard um, driven by Illumina technology because of its accuracy, its cost per base, and the overall efficiency um, that the Illumina platform has brought to um, really enable, um, you know, beyond population scale, you know, hundreds of thousands uh, of, of genomes can now be routinely sequenced at, at a variety of sites around the world, which is, is, is an amazing technology inflection point that's happened over the last several years. You know, I think if you would have asked anybody a decade ago, um, you know, how inexpensive would a, would a, would a um, full genome sequence be? And then how accurate and reliable could that be done across laboratories around the world? And I don't think anyone would have, um, uh, would have bet where, that we would be where we are today. Uh, the high per base accuracy, the consensus accuracy, the strong sensitivity to single nucleotide variants has all been driving factors to the utility of Illumina sequencing um, um, and, and, and its ability to um, uh, detect you know, such a um, high percentage of the genome in a very meaningful way. Now, one of the considerations of the Illumina sequencing is that detection of complex variants and resolution of structural variants that are significantly larger than the read length that the technology provides is, of course, challenging. Um, even with those challenges, though, uh, a 30x coverage genome remains a, a genome sequencing uh, standard in the field. And in fact, even new technologies that they come forward is often held to that standard. Now, interestingly, what I'm hope hopefully will convince everyone of today is that for as, as that relates to long read sequencing, uh, some alternative views of that standard may, may be warranted. Now, in, in long read um, genome sequencing, there's a variety of read lengths that are possible depending on the platform and depending on the mode in which the platform is run. Uh, Pacific Biosciences, I think, as I'm sure as everyone in this session is familiar, has uniquely developed the circular consensus or HIFI model, which balances read depth and per base accuracy by allowing on a single molecule basis the polymerase to go around, the, uh, around in sequence 
um, all of the bases of DNA in that uh, particular library molecule over and over again, uh, depending on movie length and depending on insert size, um, to end up with a consensus uh, accuracy on that molecule, which then drives the accuracy of the overall sequencing run. This provides good sensitivity to all variant classes, as I'm hoping to illustrate with, uh, with the rest of this presentation, as well as very large repeat and low base, to, uh, or I should say, it's, it's not to say that this technology is not without its challenges, that very large repeat areas and then regions of the genome with very low base diversity will continue um, uh, to remain challenging. So this is a, an important step forward, um, potentially could be described as an inflection point in terms of the use of long read sequencing uh, for population um, genomics, but uh, still there are areas um, uh, uh, in, in ways that this can improve. But again, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to convince everyone that uh, that consideration of a 10, uh, as, as perhaps as light as, as 8x, maybe 10 to 15x on the high end, hi-fi coverage is an emerging option, strongly balancing cost and performance. Stated a little bit differently, I don't think um, we're in a um, need of a 30 or 40x uh, hi-fi genome um, um, any longer to uh, to do the types of, uh, to meet the goals of the types of projects that I mentioned. Um, very briefly to indicate that beyond genome sequencing, I think long read sequencing is starting to be applied in, in, in manners and methodologies that are similar to the way short read sequencing was in the past, but in many cases uh, enabling. So briefly mention a, uh, a project that we've been working on with Wave Life Sciences for a number of years. Um, you know, Wave has, has disclosed this in a number of presentations, but the punchline uh, of this study is a need for a methodology to um, phase and characterize two SNPs that are adjoining the Huntington repeat that, that uh, in the RNA molecule, they're about a little over 10 KB apart. Um, and then the phasing of those heterozygous SNPs with the, which, with which molecule or which allele uh, has the, the repeat expansion in which allele is normal size is, is of critical importance for screening patients in regards to inclusion or exclusion criteria for one of their drug trials. So uh, certainly long read sequencing comes in uh, very handy for this. The, the, uh, we've migrated this project to the SQL2 platform with exceptionally high performance and very, very reliable cost-effective screening mechanisms for this unique um, genome characteristic or, or genome characterization need of phasing the Huntington's repeat um, along with uh, uh, specific SNPs on, on either side. A um, little bit more uh, maybe familiar in terms of targeted um, sequencing similar to exome or other targeted um, uh, events that take, that take advantage of uh, hybridization based capture followed by sequencing. The, the, uh, this example from uh, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, John Easton and Jingwei Zhang are, are, are two um, collaborators uh, from St. Jude that we've had the privilege of working with for, for quite, a while, quite a long time, um, have produced this, this kind of data showing that uh, long read sequencing can robustly differentiate um, and accurately call polymorphisms in the HBG1 and HBG2 uh, locus that are adjacent to each other in the genome. Um, and as you see, if you contrast the uh, Illumina labeled panel B versus the PacBio labeled panel B, uh, showing that the uh, mapping quality and overall variant resolution and coverage resolution is significantly improved um, due to the longer read lengths, in this case, um, generating insert sizes around four and a half to five KB for, uh, to allow efficient and specific capture, followed by sequencing is able to resolve these, uh, this locus. Um, this is one, one example of, of, of a number of, of targeted um, sequencing studies that, that show the same, um, uh, or I should say similar, um, similar opportunities for uh, combining long read sequencing um, with targeted capture efforts to characterize challenging regions of the genome. Now, uh, St. Jude, of course, is known for its, its, its world-leading efforts in the analysis of pediatric cancer. Uh, in, in 2018, um, uh, uh, Ma and Lu and Lu and colleagues uh, in, uh, with the senior author being uh, Jingwei Zhang published a pan-cancer analysis in it showing the both transcriptome um, um, or genome and transcriptome analysis in pediatric leukemias and solid tumors. And some of the results from one of the figures is summarized at the top. Simply um, want to draw your attention to panel A, where the different shades of uh, light gray, dark gray, and then very dark gray or black are indicative of different variant classes. The black indicating samples that uh, had structural variants detected in them. But as, as was just mentioned earlier, 
the resolution and, uh, and ability to fully characterize structural variants is often limited uh, by short read sequencing. So this is you know, another example that there are you know, significant um, biological disease state and even regulatory questions that remain around structural variant analysis uh, uh, for um, even things as important as pediatric events. And then finally, very complicated events such as chromothripsis in Ewing sarcoma may require long read sequencing. And this is, this is one example um, uh, shown here again from St. Jude, uh, indicating the uh, importance and value of long read sequencing um, in, in deciphering those regions. So I don't want to uh, spend too much time on the overall applications other than to illustrate that beyond population sequencing, et cetera, the, the ability to scale and the ability to generate reasonably cost um, uh, long read sequencing is, is will be will be is is not only enabling for um, new projects and new efforts, but also um, will be enabling to revisit some of these earlier seminal efforts that have been performed on some of these um, critically important data sets. So, in conclusion, it's just to il illustrate that long read sequencing brings an ability to map and resolve complex regions of the genome that be, you know because of the nature of those regions not necessarily due to a limitation of the, you know, the underlying short read technology, but simply complex regions require longer reads to decipher them with, with currently available analysis methods. And that's uh, the effort now is to leverage uh, the resolution that long read can bring um, to a project such as the All of Us, um, uh, the All of Us Research Project in support of a long read sequencing um, project that we're, uh, again, uh, very fortunate to, uh, to be a part of with so many outstanding colleagues from around the country from the, from the other three funded genome centers. So the goal of the long read project is, is shown here on the slide, sequence 3,000 to 6,500 all of us samples to complement the array and short read data that's, that is being generated on these samples anyways, um, with the goal of improving the resolution for large structural variants that are incompletely characterized by short read data, determine population frequencies for indel and structural variants to improve the calling of those events over all data types, stated a little differently, basically hopefully help uh, improve the um, training methods or calling methods uh, to, to um, make short read sequencing a bit better in detecting uh, these, these challenging events. And then finally, improve resolution in regions of the genome uh, because of either mapping quality or, or repeat regions that just don't resolve well with short read sequencing, such as SMN1 and 2, CYP2D6, and a number of other medically relevant regions with either challenging alignment or variant calling. So we've made some progress. We've been working on this now for, uh, for several months, and we've validated the performance of the long read platforms on control samples with known truth set data and, ha and had the uh, very fortunate opportunity for a number of groups to participate in this analysis. So I'll be summarizing and sharing some of the work across those groups. It's certainly not limited to, to our group alone, and I'll, I'll try to um, uh, call out those folks um, as appropriate, but I'll certainly recognize them at the end in the acknowledgement slide. Validated the performance and scalability of long read platforms um, to uh, evaluate if samples can be isolated from a variety of methods. Two primary ones were looked at, both chemogen and autogen isolated uh, material. And we also looked at uh, a few samples comparing blood and saliva to, to really see how, uh, uh, how those different sources of DNA perform via long read sequencing. And then, uh, you know, to meet the goals of the project is to determine the sensitivity and precision over three variant classes for low coverage, long read data. And that is structural variants, defined as anything that's 50 nucleotides and larger. Indels, defined as one to 49 nucleotides. And then, of course, single nucleotide variants, substitutions, et cetera. Now, the project had a couple, uh, has, uh, is a little bit more complicated than I'll present today. Uh, there's a, um, essentially a technology evaluation arm where we're using uh, Oxford Nanopore Promethean uh, platform, as well as the um, uh, PacBio SQL 2. We had CLR involved in the project in some of the early days. We've decided that CCS has a number of advantages um, uh, that, that place it well in favor of CLR. So we've largely dropped the CLR um, as, a, uh, as a key component of the study. We continue to perform some of the analysis on the ONT platform. Uh, there's a couple of slides that'll mention some of that. But again, I'm, I'm going to focus um, the, uh, the rest of the presentation on the analysis surrounding the PacBio platform. And rather than make this a, uh, a comparison between PacBio and Oxford Nanopore, I'm instead going to focus on some of the lessons learned and analysis that we've done um, specific to the PacBio CCS uh, data that's been generated as part of this program. So, we wanted to take a holistic approach and really look at advantage, you know, uh, what we could do on library preparation optimization. And in the interest of time, I won't go through all of those steps. 
we'll, we'll certainly make this available as we get a little more validation data and, and a bit more um, understanding of you know where our you know very strong consistencies or inconsistencies are but the two two things that we've um, I would say two highlights are uh, been able to achieve less starting material in this case uh, going to three to six micrograms of DNA input um, rather than 10 to 15 micrograms of DNA input I don't think we're the only group that's um, reduced these inputs down as, as we've gotten a little bit from, uh, more familiar with the library preparation been able to make some uh, some optimizations and then also we've largely stepped away from the blue pippin instrument um, uh, mainly because the blue, you know, blue pippin can do four samples in about six hours we kind of observed it had a little bit of a broader size selection than we really liked and so we moved in favor of a of a bit of a higher throughput process where you can get about 11 samples done every four hours you know 22 samples a day or so and, and, and it's uh, highly scalable um, to even higher throughput than that and the, the coming all together what this has done is allowed us to very very routinely produce um, um, sequencing libraries with 18 to 21 KB insert sizes and, um, and, and do so from a range of input materials, both input quality, you know, input source, and input quantity. So um, how this scales and, and the way the current workflow is architected is as follows, 32 samples a week, um, when run in 96 samples per batch. So that basically means we do one prep batch a month or so, um, and then run that over, over multiple runs on multiple instruments. So this can be accomplished with two laboratory technicians, two megareptor instruments, um, giving a capacity to shear all 96 samples in about six hours. Library preparation and size selection uh, for those 96 samples is completed over three days. And then when, when a subset of those samples, in this case with, a, with eight pack bio instruments, you can load 32 samples a week. Um, so uh, in preparation for those loads is a polymerase binding step, which takes about six hours. So let's call that a day. In total, that provides a production cycle of five days. Um, and starting from uh, you know day one at the very, very beginning, the first SQL2 load will be on day five, and then each instrument can run four samples, of course, one per cell. That gives five days to finish the run, therefore eight machines, and you just the math works out to eight machines having a capacity of 32 samples a week, three weeks per 96 samples at that one sample per smart cell. And then while the instruments are running, prepare the next batch of libraries. We found that the libraries are very stable up to polymerase binding, and that the biggest, um, biggest bottleneck in this is, is some of the uh, waiting for data to finish, waiting for data to transfer, you know, evaluating run metrics, et cetera. And so that's why we were quite enthusiastic to hear about the SQL 2E platform, which this is a, a figure taken from some of PacBio's literature, which essentially just shows the, the, the ability to parallelize analysis on that platform while collection is starting on the next smart cell, um, uh, just allowing a greater efficiency in terms of instrument runtime to be achieved. And so we're um, you know, enthusiastic about this, looking forward to you know, giving it a try in the laboratory in the near future and really seeing what kind of uh, overall efficiencies can be gained uh, on, the, on the platform. So in the, you know, what we found is, is if we, again, put all these lessons together, you can tune insert sizes pretty robustly. And, and so this was some of the work um, draw your attention just very briefly to the uh, right hand side of the slide showing the insert size from uh, around 13 KB all the way out to 36 KB. Um, quite reproducible, quite routine across, a, uh, in this case, a variety of reference samples. And we can um, see the same thing from blood, actually a bit better performance. These are all cell line derived materials. We see actually a slightly better, more consistent performance for blood derived material. And then again, good performance with saliva derived material. I'll note very quickly, that um, how the samples are, are isolated actually makes a difference. In this case, you're looking at chemogen versus autogen DNA. Um, point is, is just, it just indicates that there are some mild tweaks to the protocol, depending on what the where the samples come from and, and how they're handled. But important to note, um, shown here, again, analysis uh, performed by uh, Peter Dano, and Evan Eichler's lab at the University of Washington. Um, again, in the interest of time, just summarizing quickly that there's, the, if you look at the solid, which is uh, blood derived DNA versus the dashed, which is saliva derived DNA, in blue versus purple, which is chemogen versus, uh, versus autogen, respectively, in both um, insert size as well as quality scores, there's no appreciable difference in those samples. And then that's kind of repeated in a, in a little more detail in a tabular form below. If we take that one step further and ask, do we see differences in instrument uh, performance or bat library prep batch performance? Um, the, again, the answer is, is no. We see, again, very good, these are, these are all very recent runs, very good polymerase yields, um, as you see here, 
Uh, this has uh, been one of our largest yields we've seen yet at 510 gig uh, of raw polymerase read off the, uh, off the instrument with these coverage metrics, um, leading to almost a 12x CCS coverage on that particular sample with almost a 21 kb insert size. The, then shown on the right hand side is the two batch, the batch performance of the two samples. Um, this, this, this slight increase in insert size here was intentional. We wanted to um, try to bring this up a little bit closer to 20 KB mean. And I think we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna stay here in the 20, 21 KB range uh, for um, the mean insert size. Because as you, once you look at the CCS-based insert size or the Q20 insert size, those numbers drop off a little bit. So we wanna keep that you know, a little bit higher without, without getting too big. So now in, in terms of the probably the more important data of the presentation. Again, um, the next couple slides are, are representing work done uh, from, from Pete Adano out of Evan Leichler's group again. It was uh, fantastic to have Pete perform some of this analysis, you know, not only uh, because of the expertise of, the, uh, of him in, 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 Evan's, in Evan's lab, but also having an independent group um, look at this data as, as presented. So the next three slides have the same structure. Um, what's shown on the table is repeated in the plots on the side. And what you're looking at um, and numbered in sets one, two, three, and four is the inclusion of data from one smart cell, two smart cells, three smart cells, or four smart cells. And then what the effect of that increasing data has on true positive, false positive, false negative, precision recall in F1. And the take home message from all of this with some slight differences between whether it's a structural variant shown on this slide, indels on the next slide, or, or, uh, or SNVs on, or a single nucleotide variants on the next, is that the idea of going to a 40X CCS genome to accurately detect all three variant classes really does run into pretty rapidly diminishing returns. I think you can do a great job with one smart cell per sample, that eight or 10X coverage gets a bit better at two smart cells. So, you know, again, if, if resources allow going to two smart cells per sample would be fantastic at 16 or 20 X CCS coverage. But then you, you, again, in each of these cases, you see this drop off. If you look at the changes in precision, changes in recall, and even just the overall changes in the true positive, false positive, false negative rates, uh, it's, it's hard to justify going beyond two smart cells and maybe even from a population genomics perspective, even going beyond one smart cell uh, would be tough to justify. So again, uh, structural variant shown here, little, little bit more of an improvement between one and two smart cells in the case of indels, those one to 49 nucleotides as you see here, and a little bit represented on the graph, but again, rapidly diminishing returns as you go to three or four smart cells. And then uh, kind of in between what we saw with the structural variants and the indels, what we see in the SNBs. So again, a, 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 some improvement from one to two, then essentially no improvement as you go beyond two smart cells per sample, indicating that you can get very robust, accurate data from one smart cell, improve that slightly with two. You know, we're talking about designs of, well, what does it look like with one, uh, you know, one and a half smart cells or things like that. But for the most part, we're really focusing on one, one, uh, one smart cell per sample. So as far as data summary, we can see, you know, uh, we've generated data across a diversity of genomes and see similar performance as you see summarized here. So for the uh, Puerto Rican, Han Chinese, uh, Yoruba African, and then Ashkenazi Jewish sample, insertion, deletion, and inversion events, NDEL events, and then uh, SNB events. And you see kind of the expected pattern of changes in SNB events, depending on uh, ethnicity of the genomes. Uh, and then again, um, a very, very similar accuracies that you saw represented in the, uh, on the HG002 sample in the earlier. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just briefly cover uh, this, what's shown on this slide quite quickly, and that is um, single nucleotide variants. If we compare deep variant high five versus Clare 2 on ONT, not a huge dramatic difference between um, what we see in ONT performance versus, uh, versus PacBio, although we are uh, delving into these unique variants by uh, deep variant in, in more detail, and we'll report on that a bit later. But again, not not a I would I, I would say I'll call this not a striking difference. Where we do see a striking difference is when you look at indel uh, indel detection, which is shown here. So similar Venn diagram shown on the left hand side of the slide. Probably the best thing to to drive on the right hand side of the slide is note that the sensitivity versus indel size uh, hi fi data shown at the top very, very uh, fairly dramatically differentiated from the Illumina data in the middle and then the ONT data uh, uh, shown on the bottom. So I think it'd be safe to say that HiFi data captures indels more consistently than any other technology. Um, if you look at the location of these indels, there are many that are in medically relevant and, uh, and, and likely play a role in phenotype and diversity. And so we'll certainly be following up on this more. So um, just, to draw, just to wrap this all up in some conclusions, that increasing instrument output and chemistry consistency has now allowed HiFi genomes to be an attainable resource for small and large um, scale projects. 
Uh, the analysis of a diversity of reference samples has shown that this, that this strong performance and sensitivity can be achieved with a reasonable amount of DNA input, three to six micrograms, as well as coverage, 10 to 12X, hi-fi. And then we see no obvious differences with source material, including blood versus saliva, and that the hi-fi data really truly captures a full spectrum of structural variants, indels, and SMBs, including medically relevant variants that we, that we observed in, in this data that are missed by Illumina and ONT. Um, and then also we had an opportunity to see that Illumina indel sensitivity does decrease as indel size goes up. So as I, I tried to mention a few of the key folks involved in this, uh, in this effort, um, during the presentation, but I'll certainly recognize um, the lab group at, at, at Hudson Alpha Discovery with uh, the names bolded are those that have contributed substantially to the project, particularly Nepesh Prasad, who's, who's led most of the library preparation and optimization efforts, Ariana uh, Pianzio, who has uh, been a, put a huge amount of effort into the running of the sequencing machines for both platforms, the, the funding sources that uh, I mentioned between all of us and Gabriela Miller, our colleagues at St. Jude, and then of course, uh, a, a huge thank you to the uh, to the other groups participating that are directly participating in this analysis with us in the All of Us program. Peter Dono, William Harvey, and Evan Eichler at University of Washington, Seattle, and then Fritz and Medhat at uh, at Baylor. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Look forward to uh, a few minutes of questions, uh, question and answer time. Thanks. Hi everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, today with me, I have uh, Sean Levy, who's the CSO of uh, Discovery Life Sciences and a faculty investigator of Hudson Alpha. Um, we have a few minutes here for some additional Q&A. Um, so if you could go ahead and uh, put your questions up into the chat, um, I'd be happy to read those for Sean and we'll get started there. Let's see, I can see there's questions coming in. So Sean, maybe maybe in the meantime, while those are coming in, uh, maybe you can elaborate on on you know what has been kind of the biggest challenge to get, to get these programs rolling and, and kind of get them jump started. Uh, so specific to the long read programs, you know, it, it's just been um, coming from a traditionally short read sequencing laboratory, just getting oriented to. Um, you know, just the different considerations on the long read sequencing, both, both, you know, the, the advantages and, and just, uh, and challenges in working with higher molecular weight DNA, new, new processes, new library prep methods, uh, mechanisms of QC, even, and then extending more recently all the way through to, um, what's the ideal reference for, for long read sequencing mm -hmm. as, as you get into de novo assembly. And, and when you look at contributions like the T to T project and, and similar, um, you know, the, it, it brings up lo lots of new and interesting questions as to how to best evaluate this data. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I never thought about the, the reference choosing. That would be a difficult one to kind of come across as to and, and what just, just for my own knowledge here, as I can st still see stuff typing here. Um, what what type of reference did you actually choose? I mean, there's so many out there. Like what was the determining factors in that? Yeah, I, so it's it's probably the usual the usual process, you know. So uh, if you're comparing long read and short read data together, coordinate ba coordinate based system is really important. So you know, GRC thir GRCH thirty eight is uh, is kind of the standard. It, you know, we we still use um, uh, earlier references because of uh, the, the cases of clinical annotation in, in some in some projects. But I would say it's it's you know thirty eight certainly the the standard. Um, but you know, interestingly, and, and I think uh, you know, earlier talk today about Evan Eichler and um, and and a number of other number of other studies that are um, ongoing, particularly with the substantial integration of long read data for um, phased and de novo assembly. You know, it, it's a uh, probably a pretty compa or I would expect will travel down a road that you end up having kind of dual analysis paths for whole long read whole genome sequencing. One analysis path is to align to a coordinate system so you can um, uh, annotate and interpret data along those lines. And the other, if your ultimate goal is you know really truly uh, identification and, and and cataloging of all of all structural variants, um, uh, that a you know a more phased reference based analysis sure. will be advantageous. Yeah, definitely. All right, so I have a couple of questions here from a, a number of, of people here. Um, library prep for the 96 samples per batch, yes. is this done manually or is uh, automation used? Uh, it's primarily manually, but with multi-channel pipettes. So we, we've not yet put it on a deck. Um, the, uh, 
it's still a small enough batch with the uh, with the steps involved, and in, in, at least in our lab and in our environment, um, if things are you know less than 384 samples going through at a time, maybe with the exception of bead purifications, which in, the, in that case they're all done on deck um, to allow easy supernate removal. But no, that it's still a fairly manual process. Um, that's uh, that's that's done. Yeah, a lot of hands-on stuff there yeah. for sure. Still, yeah, there's still. I mean, we're 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 we we're very comfortable with the manual process of being able to get consistent and desired sizes of the of the insert sizes. You know, probably we're we're really happy with the you know twenty to twenty one kb size ranges. I'm pretty really happy with that. Um, so far. So I don't think we'll deviate too much from it, but we've, we've been able to show you can kind of tune that from any, anything with a low of 13, probably to a high of mid thirties for, for standard DNA isolation material. If you want to go much higher than the thirties, then it, it takes some really special handling. Yeah. Um, and, but again, we haven't for the CCS reads for the goals of the projects we've undertaken um, that 20 KB range seems to be really good. And, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see if uh, I, I'd, I'd really have to consider the automation schemes to, um, make sure it'd be worth it. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. And then, uh, along the lines of automation, this one switches to the analysis side. Uh, what are the biggest challenges for automating the, the data analysis portion, clinical report outputs, et cetera? Yeah. So I think maybe that gets to our earlier discussion Dep depends on the goal. Um, yep. you know, if it's, you know, so I would say very simply, um, there are some gr there in, in GitHub, you know, uh, Karen Grabella at the Broad has a, a fantastic pack bio analysis pipeline that he's put up in GitHub that, that, he, that the version that he's put together at Broad runs in Google Cloud. Uh, I, I don't know of any other um, as comprehensive tools as he's put together. There may be some out there. Uh, Mike Schatz is another one that's developed some analysis pipelines that are really fantastic. Um, but again, it, it depends on the goal. If, it, if clinical annotation is the goal, then, you know, again, a, a, an HD38 followed by, you know, kind of pick your favorite clinical annotation pipeline is going to make sense for all the usual stuff. What we know is the single nucleotide variants and the small indels are, are, uh, are, are really good. If you're, if you're going down the road of, um, you know, short read genome negative clinical samples that you're reflexing to long read, I think in those cases, you know, certainly doing the structural analysis in, in the typical fashion makes sense. But I think also in those cases, you want to look a little deeper uh, for novel structural variants or novel indel events that may not be as obvious um, in a in a uh, earlier reference based consort or, or uh, reference based effort, and instead may want to consider, um, you know, again an, an alternate analysis pipeline that uh, where annotation won't be as easy, but your insights will probably be a lot deeper. Sure. Okay, perfect. Um, everybody, uh, unfortunately, that's uh, all the time we have for today's Q&A. Um, if you've supplied questions um, that haven't been answered, uh, we will definitely get you answers to those uh, and follow up with you on those. So uh, be patient and we will get you those answers. Okay. Um, thank you, Sean, for your time today and for jumping on here. Yeah, thanks. Great. Good talk. Right. Thank you very much.